Okay, so I'm introducing myself very quickly. My name is Jean-Georges or JG uh, Perrin, and I'm an architect working for Advanced uh, Auto Parts. And uh, I'm really excited to announce uh, to, to work with uh, Adolfo, my boss, today. And well, he's my boss all the time, but the today uh, the announcement, and you see my excitement. So um, without further ado, Adolfo, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, JG, uh, and really appreciate uh, the, the the invitation to to speak here. Obviously, uh, really good to meet you all. If I don't I don't know you, and looking at the names, I'm not seeing names that I recognize. Uh, so most of the names new to me, but uh, good to talk to you. Uh, my name is Adolfo Rodriguez. I lead our technology transformation here uh, at Advance Auto, and I'd love to just tell you a little bit about our company and what we do, and then more importantly, really about uh, our technology uh, and how we're, we're driving forward. So, so first and foremost, I'll tell you just a little bit more about myself. I'm a, I'm a software guy. I, I built uh, you know, a lot of software back, back in the day. I spent a considerable amount of time at, at IBM and then subsequently uh, at Citrix. Um, and you know, during that time really was just very much uh, you know, software centric enterprise grade software um, and you know, spent a considerable amount of time kind of um, you know, refining my skills there. And so and the question is, what in the world am I doing selling auto parts? Uh, and that would be, uh, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of this discussion, you'll, you'll get a sense as to what really we're doing. So to give you just a perspective, uh, you know, Advanced Auto Parts is obviously a retailer. So we're number 313 fluctuates every year or so in the Fortune 500 list. Uh, we are headquartered out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where I'm, I'm sitting right now, not in our headquarter building because obviously COVID, uh, but, uh, but we've moved our headquarters here fairly recently, a couple of years ago. Um, think of it this way, 5,000 or so stores, uh, you know, nationwide, most of our presence is really in, uh, in the United States and Canada. We have several sub-brands, maybe uh, stores that you've seen either on uh, in your town or, or other uh, you know, parts of the country. Um, CarQuest is fairly well known. Of course, Advanced Auto is well known. And then some that really serve more of our professional customer base. Um, uh, Auto Part International, World Pack, these are perhaps, you know, trucks or vans that you've seen kind of driving around. Uh, we have around the sixth, seventh largest fleet uh, in the country for, for any company. Uh, so it's a huge, uh, huge fleet. Around $10 billion in uh, in sales uh, and, and really just presence both in what we call the DIY consumer. So you and I both kind of walking in uh, into a store or going to our e-commerce website online, uh, as well as very large professional shops all the way down to uh, you know, smaller, uh, smaller shops. Um, our main thing is you know, we, you know, we're a collection of folks that really cater towards the motorists, cater towards the enthusiasts, uh, cater toward uh, people that really take care of their car. And in fact, our motto is really about care and speed and really driving value to our customers, whether they be the professional garage, uh, you know, shop owner, uh, or they be the, the DIY consumer. Uh, it's really about ensuring that we give the right part, uh, at, you know, at the right time and the right way uh, to our customers. And of course, you can imagine that doing that uh, at scale uh, can be challenging at times. So if you look at our complex uh, set, uh, you know, inter interconnected set of systems that drive our technology, there, there's, there's uh, you know, a vast number of, of systems that interconnect together. But we bring the value to our customer with a rich set of customer facing systems uh, that, that drive the experience. Now, as you can imagine, being a Fortune 500 large retailer, that means we have a website, uh, which you can transact on, it means we have a mobile app, which you can transact on. We have a loyalty program called Speed, for, Speed Perks. We also have uh, the same um, discipline on our professional side, slightly different, catered towards the more professional. So if I have a garage, I have five bays, I'm working on cars, I'm going to speak to you in a different way than if I'm a, you know, a, a teacher that's just trying to you know, get, get to work and, and need to you know, do uh, find a replacement part. So we, we try to really... Um, provide uh, best class customer experiences to our consumers, uh, depending on you know, where they come from, and what they do. One little known fact is actually that we 
also have a growing set of e-services or cloud services that uh, drive additional value to our consumers. So whether they mean uh, really knowing what to do uh, from, a, from a technical perspective in terms of how to uh, actually perform a job, uh, how things work together, et cetera, or something as simple as estimating driving, you know, dri uh, job repairs. Hey, I have a repair that I need to perform. Uh, how much is that gonna look like? And so we use AI technologies to help us drive that interaction. And so it really is that kind of collective uh, family of, of capability that uh, allows us to deliver the value to our, to our customers. Now, moving forward, when you look at the, the, the big picture of our systems and how they work together, you can imagine being a large scale Fortune 500 cost, you know, a company with the sixth largest fleet in the, con in, in the uh, country, um, as well as 5,000 stores, it could get pretty complex, right? Uh, and so there's an incredible amount of logistics in terms of managing our supply chain, of dealing with our suppliers, interacting with, um, you know, with, our, with the vendors that, that, that supplies. And of course, there's every aspect of that typical sort of large scale retail uh, complexity that comes through. And it's also complicated by something that's really, um, really intrinsic in the automotive area, which is this notion of the fitment problem, meaning that in, in the automotive uh, retail space, it isn't just that, hey, I'm selling you this product or, uh, you know, fitment might be just large, small, extra large, petite, but rather it's a complex web of multiple parts and how they fit with um, with uh, the many vehicles that are on the road. And in fact, in some cases, some automotive parts fit certain vehicles in another vehicle. So it's, think of it as a sparsely connected graph uh, with, with uh, a, a large set of parts and a large set of uh, vehicle types. And so anyway, that complexity leads to some pretty interesting computer science problems and uh, lots of things that JG and I get excited about. Now, from a worldwide perspective, you know, we have a growing presence. Uh, while most of our, our retail, um, you know, business is really cornered, cornerstone in, in the United States, our digital presence is actually worldwide. Uh, we have uh, labs in a number of different uh, areas that help us to deliver products that um, delight our customers. Um, the next slide really shows a quick picture of some of our team members. Uh, we took this at a, at a meeting that we were happened to uh, happen to have, and you can see uh, some of the folks here. And actually, when you look at some of these, as, as I'm looking through the, the people that were there that day, uh, many of these folks came from the software uh, space, from the software sector. We have grown now a large uh, technology group uh, within Advanced Auto, and that's something where, you know, lately over the last couple of years, we've been really honing in on evolving our 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 engineering space to drive a higher discipline as we become essentially a technology company. Uh, now in that space, of course, uh, it's, it's challenging and doing that in a way that's respectful with really what moves us, what really drives us. We have a passion to really meet our customers on their terms. We want to give them the capability that allows them to do what they do. But at the same time, it really is about building a, a large scale enterprise software discipline that allows us to bring those products faster, uh, you know, slower, uh, sl lower time to market, so faster from a, uh, a resolution perspective. We want to drive towards better, more unique, design-driven user experiences. We want to innovate using the best tools that are available in, in today's world, particularly around, of course, cloud engineering and uh, cloud principles. And we want to, of course, accelerate the features. Now, we have some few basic principles that we've instituted uh, in terms of our technology transformation. Um, one of those, for example, is we're, we're not gonna build things that someone's already built, right? There's no point in uh, us reinventing the wheel and whether that wheel be uh, you know, software that we can just acquire. Um, there are many cases where, where we do that and we leverage those existing pieces of software. But lately and now as we've grown our staff, as we've gotten a broader technology presence in the company, uh, we're leveraging open source, right? Uh, and in leveraging open source, so open source, not just in, in terms of using open source, but now starting to contribute more to open source. And what we're really talking about today is how we're going to start sharing open source so items that we built and of course bringing to the open source community. And you know, collectively we view that as, as, a, a, as a progression, 
you know, I mean, quite frankly, uh, our, our technology team is, is still sort of fairly new in terms of this, you know, rejuvenation, this revival of technology that has occurred now in advance. Of course, I'm happy to be a part of that. Now, just to give you a sampling of the types of things that we've been looking at, of course, the very first step in our journey was let's use, right? Uh, and in cases where you know, we want to leverage modern technology, um, React, for example, that we're really has now started to hone in as, as kind of our standard for uh, front end, uh, you know, for front end development. We're using more Node.js for some of our back end development uh, and a collection of tools, Kafka now for you know, event streaming as we relay all these uh, pieces of information now back and forth around what's happening in our inventory, what's happening with, uh, with our supply chain. How does all that you know, transactional data flow through the enterprise in a way that allows us to scale? Um, so this is just a sampling um, of some of the open uh, technologies that we use. Uh, we're leveraging Red Hat OpenShift as really our, our platform as a service. And now the collection of these tools really allow us to, you know, they're an integral part of how we move forward. So as I said, uh, you know, the bulk of what we're doing is really building the things that make us unique, that makes us special. We're not going to go off and, you know, re-implement or rebuild something that, uh, that we shouldn't. Uh, but at the same time, leveraging what exists really is twofold. It is really one, a matter of um, open source where, where it exists and where it serves our needs um, and it being a participant in that community and of course leveraging software products from many of our fine uh, technology partners that have uh, really paved the way for us in terms of driving forward. Now, we know, of course, that innovation is really closely tied to uh, the open source community. You know, a lot of the companies that you see, and in fact, many of the large scale retailers that you would view as very technology savvy, uh, they tend to have a pretty robust uh, open source, um, you know, open source program. And for us, um, you know, really is no different. You know, what, we, what we're what we growing into and aspiring to, to, to achieve, uh, we see those, those two things, uh, you know, fairly harmonious in the sense that we want our innovators to take advantage of all the great work that's happening out in the industry. We want them to be, you know, have a finger on the pulse in terms of how things are going, but it isn't enough. It's not sufficient enough for us to just be simply users. Uh, it is also not sufficient for us to be contributors. We want to start to think now, how do we share the components, things that we build that you know, allow us to, to really foster that level of collaboration with the open source community and um, you know, enabling us to sort of uh, you know, pr provide value as we of course uh, extract value. And so we, we see it as a two way street and that's uh, what we're driving forward uh, you know, to doing. Um, so what we're looking at doing now and what we're, what we're really are announcing today is, is just the first of our, um, an open project that uh, JG will tell you a lot more detail about. We call our initiative the Open Source Garage, right? So of course, everything that, that, that we do is themed uh, you know, towards the, the automotive space. Uh, and if you've you know, picked up a wrench or two, then uh, you'll be familiar with uh, a, a lot of these things. But you know, we're really looking to, uh, to, to drive forward in, in terms of uh, this, this uh, sharing and uh, angle. And JG is going to tell you a lot more about what we're doing with the Data in the Fast Lane project. Uh, but, you know, you should view this as really just, um, it, it's a start, it's the evolution of uh, how we're, we're building software and uh, how we're participating, um, in, you know, in the open source world. JG, you're on mute. Yeah, I was on mute. Thank you, Adolfo. Uh, so, so it's my it's my great pleasure to talk to you a little bit about um, about data in the fast lane. As you can, as you know, the theme is about all the, all the automotive. So it made sense that when we're talking about building an ETL tool, well, it's also based on the on the on the automotive theme. Um, but it's not. We we wanted to build something that was really easy to use, um, where you can do your transformation on the fly, uh, that where you can scale cr like crazy, and that's also why it's backed by Apache Spark. Um, and uh, those of you who attend the conference know that I'm kind of uh, uh, talking about Spark in a few in a few sessions. So. Let's let's look a little bit about the details. First, yeah, it's open source. We just said it. It's our first open source product. Product. We are we are 
putting on the market. Um, you can you can already go to Git, uh, GitHub and clone it. Um, it's an Apache 2 business friendly license. Just go and enjoy it. It's standalone. It means that you can use it as a standard piece. You don't need extra software. It just built in. Uh, it brings all you need uh, right away. It's easy to use. Not going to lie. There's a small learning curve, like with every tool. But past that, you're going to enjoy it very quickly. It's fast. It's backed by uh, Apache Spark. It's scalable. Uh, did I mention that it was backed by Apache Spark? Um, and it's uh, container ready. So you will be able to just get it uh, and run it in your Docker container right away or OpenShift. Uh, it's cloud ready. It's not because it's the containers that it's automatically cloud ready. It 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 allows you to also get data from AWS uh, back and forth using uh, the um, S3 or any other database on the cloud. Really, it's scriptable. So basically, well, you define your ETL as a script, as a YAML script, or it's embeddable. So you mean you can use uh, data in the fast lane directly. As, an, as a library that you would embed into your own applications. It's extensible. That would make kind of sense. So it's an ETL. You've got your specific data transformation. You're, you've got some existing routines. You can directly build them and add them directly to, to the tool. OK. So uh, and uh, finally, um, yeah, it's source control. Source control. Is, is really important, right? I, I think we are all use source control. Well, some ETLs are not ready for source control. Here you can use source control for, of course, your scripts, and you can also so use source control for your extensions in a very easily way. So let's get into a little bit of architecture. Uh, I'm an architect after all. So basically what you are going to work on is using a, a recipe file. The recipe file is going to be processed by data in the fast lane, which connects to an existing cluster or creates one on the fly and gets the data from almost any database or almost any kind of files. It runs the DFL recipe and then in this, in this scenario, outputs the data in a, in a database, but it could be you know, on the screen or um, as files or whatever. So let's jump into a demo, OK? So I'm going to, pick, to, to, to run a very, very simple demo and show you, um, and show you um, a recipe as well. So let's get out of here, OK? So let's look at that. OK, so my first demo, as you can see, I'm just going to run uh, DFL as a shell. And my demo is one from the repo, which is doc slash demo slash recipe demo 01 dash display. So it's going to take a, a CSV file, a really basic CSV file, and it's going to display it as well. I'm showing some information about the about the CSV file. OK, nothing really exciting, but um, it's a first demo just to show you the principle of it. So I started it. So in this scenario, it's not connecting to uh, to an existing cluster. It just spawns a cluster right right part of the part of the process, and it's starting the recipe. And you see, it uh, actually read my uh, books.csv file, and it's counting the number of records. Oh, sorry, it's counting my number of records. I've got 24 rows in my file, displaying displaying um, uh, five rows and showing me the schema of, of what is in my file. See, if I look at my, um, at my recipe, um, so to show you what it looks like, you will see that it's a very basic file. Let's run anyone's favorite text editor. And you see that it's basically, I'm asking, um, I'm, I'm starting, um, I've got a magic container called a store, which has an attribute called books. Then I'm going to do some operations. So my first operation is load uh, from this pass here. Then I'm going to specify which format it is. I'm going to pass a few options uh, like saying, hey, this is, it has an header. It, it please infuse a schema so it knows what an int is, what a string is, and what is a, what is a quote what is a quote within the the, uh, the ingestion process. And then finally, the only thing I'm doing is hey, 
here's the operation. It's count rows operation. The next operation is show. I've got two parameters like number of records and trunk eight, whether I want to shorten or not, display and print schema. Okay, very easy. Not that useful maybe, but it's uh, it's to show you what what uh, what uh, what we can do with it. So let's let's look at a little bit of a more slightly more um, slightly more interesting uh, object. And uh, so in this scenario, I'm going to build a nested documents from two tables. So I've got two. Um, two tables, which are in a Postgres database here. Um, there's a list of orders, there's a list of books. And what I'm interested in is building this nested document, which is composed of a name, an offer link, a Wikipedia link, a title, and, and then every, every book as a list, okay? Um, I can actually um, show you what it looks like in, uh, in Postgres and I show you the, the demo as well. Okay, so let's get there. Okay, here is my, here's Postgres, uh, making that a little bit bigger. Uh, maybe that's a little bit too big. So basically here you, you can see I have two tables. One is my offers. Uh, and the columns, ID, names, etc., and you see also my books. Okay, so and you see on the right side here something very simple. Uh, so it's the same, the same data here. Here is my list of offers. Now I'm going to ask um, Data in Fastlane to execute this demo, this, this, and that's my demo two, and create this nested document. And this is built nested document. Okay. So same thing. It's starting creating a cluster, uh, which is always a, the tax the, the the little bit longer part uh, when you're dealing with Spark. And then it's uh, reading all the configuration file. There's probably a little typo somewhere there. And then it reads everything. So it, here it has read all my offers. And then it reads, uh, it reads my books. Oh, I didn't display the books, and uh, you see the result. Okay, so 25, 25, uh, 25 seconds for that. So if I want now to look at the result as a JSON file, as my JSON file here, you see that here I can see that Damien Denis Diderot um, wrote two books. Uh, and I can see, you know, JK Rowling. Uh, I can see all the list of books in that. So, you know, pretty simple output. And now we can have a look at the output as well, at the recipe itself. So the recipe is a bit is a bit more complex, but not that much. Okay. So here's my recipe. See, I'm defining the first part of my recipe is I'm defining a connection to a database. Okay. And this is really where, of course, you don't put your password in a configuration file. Okay. Which I did here for demonstration purpose only. Okay. But, but DFL is smart enough to get uh, information from uh, secrets or environment variables. So, and then uh, my next step is uh, define my store where I'm going to uh, load my books from JDBC, my offers from the JDBC connector, and then I can do a few operations. Okay, so first, everything is called an ID in the database. If you look at if you if you look at the database here, everything is called an ID. Where I'm more interested in having a book ID and an offer ID, for make it, it easier for for me to make joins after. So what I'm doing is. Uh, renaming all these columns very easily. As you can see, I've got my my ID. I rename it to offer ID. My kernel link, I rename it to offer link, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I'm displaying a little bit of information. Doing the same thing with books. And then what I'm asking is creating this table called works. And this is a complex operation which I built, which is a nested group by, where I'm taking a creating a new table a new table or uh, data frame technically in the Spark language, which is taking books 
and it's actually creating this uh, this group by on the name of a link on Wikipedia uh, link, and it's nesting the title of the book, the release date of the table of the book, and the link of uh, towards the book. And then I'm showing that quickly, and that's it. Okay, so so that's really. Um, yeah, if I were using something else, I could tell you the number of lines of code, but it's it's not that much line of code to do a rather complex data operations here. So, um, I was I was also telling you that um, that we were uh, it's extensible. So let let's look at my third demo, which is about this extensibility. Yeah. Okay, so I am going, you, you're probably at this case as well, okay? So sometimes you get a table and in your table, you have, you have, um, you have data that have, you have multiple, pri multiple keys that are actually building your primary keys. And that's really annoying because when you went to make joins, you've got to, you know, you've got to join on both columns or create an, a, some kind of a composite key. Um, and that's, 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 that's a bit annoying. So what we had to do is we created just a multiple, uh, a primary key from uh, multiple keys. And to do that, um, I'm going to show you the data. And I'm going to show you after how we process that with uh, with um, data in the fast lane. So let's look at the data first. And I'm just going to do a cat the data uh, product filter. So here you can see my data. Um, you see my part number. I've got a skew as well, and I've got a name and and the link. Okay. So this, this what, what I'd like to solve as a problem is to have a unique identifier that will uh, that I can use for the part number and this queue as well and this queue. So let's let's run it and see how it looks after that and then I'll show you the recipe. Okay, so um, DFL and it's going to be doc demo. Uh, demo three, and I'm going to run it. Okay, same thing, creating the cluster on the fly. Here it's loading the CSV. It's not a big CSV as you saw, it's something like five records. And here it is, okay. So um, I've got my part number and SQ in a tabular way, which is a bit more readable. And what we've added is this, that, so that's an original file and that's a modified that's a modified data at the end of it. And you see here that um, I've added a unique ID that is defined based on my um, part number and queue. And if I, of course the goal is that if I rerun it, I get exactly the same values uh, for as my unique ID. Otherwise it's going to be a little bit, uh, not very useful, right? And uh, so how to do that is we build a, spe a specific operation, which is really a few lines of Java code in this situation uh, and see it's exactly the same. So it's uh, EB something and EB 90 here as well. Um, so, and we are just, and it's not an operation you find in Spark. So we leverage what Spark calls um, user defined functions. And that's, that's how we've built this part. Okay, so now if I run, if I look at the recipe, you see that that's it. That's that's what fifteen lines of code basically. So basically, I'm I'm running, uh, I'm opening my uh, my 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 file called product. Uh, um, the, the path is that data slash product slash filters dot CSV. It's a CSV file. It has a header. I ask Spark to infuse a schema. And then I'm just telling it, hey, create this attribute ID. And to do that, you are going to, well, actually there's a lot of show here. And then it just 
create this gen this uh, generate this UUID uh, and you're going to use partner and SKU. Okay, so really, really uh, fairly easy way to uh, to, um, to 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 um, to, to start and to make to make this kind of uh, data transformation recipe, and and really what we were focusing about when we we, we were designing this tool is the multiple personas that will be able to use um, uh, data in the fast lane. So you can be a data scientist, uh, and you need um, to. You know that in most in most companies, um, data scientists they have to. They, they do a lot of data engineering work. Uh, so I'm not saying we have a solution for that, but at least the data engineering work is, is going to be a lot more, a lot, a lot easier uh, for that. So that's really uh, the, the typical persona for, for Sonia as a data scientist. Um, data, data, a data engineer is, is building extensions for, uh, for DFL, where uh, DFL is, um, uh, can be ex can be extended like for the gen, gen UUID I showed you, and that's an extension, and that's that's a word for typically as a data engineer. And finally, we've got Eric's DevOps, who is in charge of extending uh, the features of DFL, the core features of DFL, and putting into production. So every user will find his way in. So, and finally, well, getting started with it. So it's really easy. Um, you go. You can go right now to github.com slash advanced auto parts and uh, you find the data, data in the fast lane. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at advanced OSS and more and more documentation will actually be migrated from what we have in the repo to Medium. Um, and that's going to be on medium.com slash advanced OSS. So I hope you enjoy that um, and that you, but we will meet and, uh, and uh, talking about the uh, data in the fast lane soon. So thank you, everyone. Uh, great, great job, JG. Um, love love the, uh, the example that you, you, you gave. I, I don't see any questions yet, but I guess I, I had one. Um, do, you get, do you have plans to do more, um, more and more open source projects going forward? I, I, I don't know, is this recorded? <laughs> Adolfo, you want to answer this one? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a muscle that we're building that we're gonna, you know, continue to flex. But our view here is, you know, it's 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 one of several steps in in our journey, and um, definitely something that we'll consider. I mean, right now, when, you know, concrete plans not yet. We're starting with this one, but uh, you know, you can you can bet we're thinking about you know where this goes from here and. What other projects you know fit the bill for for open source? And 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 really, if if you if you like if you like this one, help us make this this one a success, and we will probably have all those coming. I need right. to show uh, corporate PKA, PKAs now. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any questions out there in the chat or Q and A? You could, you could, uh, anybody want to raise their hand? Well, thank you guys. Uh, this was, this was, this was, this was a blast and uh, uh, we'll talk soon, I hope. Yep, give us, a, so by the way, JG, I see you put your alias there. My alias is Adolfo at advanced.shadow.com. Uh, okay. uh, so, if, so if you want, want to type less characters, but we'd love to hear from from people out there. Thanks, thanks for having us.